Fellow of the American Numismatic Society. The American Numismatic Society is both a library, an archive, and um, a repository with gallery space and educational space of amazing coins, the largest in North America and one of the leading collections in the world. And it's my honor with their curator of Roman coins to direct the Roman Republican Die Project. But the most fabulous experience I have with the Roman Republican Die Project is working with Brooklyn College students. And today, I have Victoria Rishi and Keely Christmas, who are both classics majors, who agreed under some duress to come and join the world of coins and have both shown amazing aptitude for this work. So I'd love for them to come forward and tell you something about their work on RRDP. Hello, you guys. Okay. Just do it now, I guess. Hopefully that's the way. All right, good morning, y'all. Hello. Uh, as Professor Yarrow mentioned, my name is Victoria. This is Keely. All right, and we are here to talk about our project, Rare But Not Unknown, Filling in the Blanks in Coinage of the Roman Republic Online. All right, so first uh, we are going to introduce the Schaefer Archive. Uh, so about 30 years ago, Dr. Richard Schaefer began collecting images of coins from the uh, Roman Republic. Um, it is estimated that he has collected about 300,000 images of coins, and those images are compiled into 14 binders and then several drawers full of clippings. So as you can see here, these are the binders. So it's open, and then there are drawers here, drawers here. Um, and then in the year 2020, the archive was digitized. And so here on the right, we see uh, an example page of that digitized digitization. Um, it is um, a page from binder six. In terms of transcribing Dr. Schaefer's archive, there was kind of a learning process that we had to go through in order to understand his labeling methods. So we have here the source, the access, diameter, weight, and any other notes. The key things here were the source. We want to make sure that we could validate and confirm where he's linking these coins to, but also the notes add to the coin's history. So sometimes he would say that they were mismatched or mislabeled or that they were overstruck, which we will see later on. And also sometimes he wondered if they were possibly fake. So it was very interesting to see his own notes on the coins. And yeah, it was very key to pay attention to his writing style because it was sometimes very hard to read. So some of the methods and tools that we used, the key ones were Google Slides, Google Sheets, and Excel. That's where we would organize and streamline some of the information he provided us with. We also needed to use auction websites because we had to confirm that information, make sure we could actually find the coin. And Mirador acted as a place where we could link that digitized archive to that information in the Excel and the slides and Google Sheets. Okay, next, so I'm going to introduce um, these two things here. I've got um, Michael H. Crawford's Roman Republican Coinage uh, is a book that was published in 1974, and uh, today it remains the primary typology for um, identifying coins from the Roman Republic. Um, and then here is Crow. So this is an open online, um, sorry, open access database which provides an online version of Crawford's book, uh, RRC. Um, so. With Crow, users can browse. Um, you can search for any specimen that might appear in Crawford's book. Um, and then with Crow, um, it offers high-res images, uh, something that just wouldn't be possible in a printed version of the book. So how do we connect Schaefer's archive and Crow? Um, so here is, uh, this is a screenshot from Crow. And so as you can see, Right here, we are missing uh, an image for 82 slash 1. Um, so it is 
our challenge to um, search through the uh, Schaefer archive to fill in gaps like this. So if you see over here on the right, um, we did find uh, an example of this coin. So there at the very bottom corner is one image of this coin. Um, it is actually the only known surviving specimen of this coin type. And uh, we found it in binder four on page 209, there at the very bottom. <laughs> So this is the key question of our research. Why does archiving Dr. Schaefer's work matter? Well, coins are visual signifiers. They point to an economic, social, or political condition that the Roman Republic was going through at the time of the coins distribution. So here we have an English token penny commissioned in 1814 for Sierra Leone, and it was celebrating the abolition of slavery in 1807. As you can see here, you see a gentleman shaking hands with a slave. Um, that points to Roman iconography, which talks about the open hand or the hands linking to one another as a form of reconciliation or partnership as well as a sort of truce. So we see here that Roman iconography is incredibly influential to modern iconography and even history. This is an example of a coin that I was tasked to find. The key parts of looking for rare coins is making sure to pay attention to the details. So we have three different versions of this coin. We have 3A, 3B, 3C. The only difference is really the placement of the pellets. So we see here they're in the frame of a arrow or a triangle, and also the placement of the Roma. So is it below the prow or inside the prow? And also how Hercules is adorned. Is he wearing anything? Does he have a beard? All of that establishes if I'm looking at the right coin. And this is a bronze coin with the prow on one side and Hercules on the other. All right, so here is a closer look at that coin I mentioned before, 82 slash one. Um, so yeah, as Keely mentioned, uh, we have to pay very close attention to the details. So on the obverse or in the front of the coin is the head of Ceres, uh, who can, you can see here. She is identifiable by her crown of wheat sheaths. Uh, you might know her better by her Greek counterpart's name, Demeter. Um, and then, uh, on the reverse, on the other side, is Hercules fighting a stag, which might not be as clear. Uh, you can kind of make out the body of the stag, um, but uh, when you see um, iconography of Hercules, it does become a bit more clear. So as you can see here, um, this is an image of the, it's, it's on a sarcophagus, it uh, has images of the Herculean labors. So it's very, very similar, right? So you have the stag here, even Hercules with his bent knee over the stag. And yeah, images like that make it way more clear what we're looking at. Um, but then, let's see. So another very interesting thing about this coin, other than the fact that it is the only known surviving specimen, um, as Keely mentioned before, it is an overstrike. So if you look very closely right here, uh, you can see some lines and some dots which don't quite belong, and you can even see them um, above. Dr. Schaefer uh, drew them in. So you have these little dots that kind of look like teeth. Um, well, that is because they are teeth. Um, so this is um, uh, coin 42 slash two. Um, on it, it is uh, the head of Hercules with the lion head on top, and there are some teeth here. In fact, those are the teeth there. Um, so what happened was this coin here was uh, it's a bronze coin. It wasn't fully melted down before this one was struck on top. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, so till now, Crow couldn't provide info regarding this uh, the specimen's location or what it looked like. Now with Dr. Schaefer's help, uh, we know what it looks like and we also know that it's in Turin. So right here, it's in ligature, so it's kind of hard to make out. Uh, Turin or Torino in Italy. Um, so now this info will be accessible to future researchers. And a big thank you to everyone listed, American Numismatic Society, Dr. Richard Schaefer, the Arate Foundation, Mellon Transfer Research Program, uh, Dr. Lucio Carbone, Professor Lee Viaro, and then Dr. Alice Sharpless.
Oh, yeah. Oh, um, a bit, yeah. I mean, I know about the Herculean labors. Um, the stack, that was just one of the labors that, um, so uh, that it's Hera that, that gave them to him, that he was supposed to not be able to, to perform, um, but he did because he's Hercules. <laughs> The funniest thing? I mean, we've noticed that there's a prow on so many coins, and it's very, it's very interesting to think about. Um, I mean, the Romans like to um, take things from um, people that they've defeated in battle or conquered. Um, so uh, one of the, the things that the Romans took from the Carthaginians uh, was the, uh, with, with, with their boats, right? So the front of the boat, the prow, is often on coins. And it's, it's almost every single one that I've dealt with so far. Um, so I, I just think of it as like this very like, ha ha Carthage, look, it's on our coin. <laughs> I think one of the interesting things that I found is that, like you said, there's always the usage of the prowl, but sometimes I, you know, because I'm in English, I always have a tendency to be very curious about how they connect two images on the coin. So we had the Janus, which is like a two-headed figure, and then the prow on one side. And I was very curious. I asked Dr. Um, Lee Yarrow, like, why do they tend to connect these two images together? And then we kind of talk about how Janus is both looking to the future and the past. So in relation to the prow, it's like, look at our past achievements and look what we can still conquer was really fascinating to think about. Thank you guys. Thank you.
kind of STEM research that is wholly alien to everything that I do. But this year, fortunately, we have a, we have a large array of humanities and, and sort of humanities adjacent social sciences topics. And we're going to be seeing hopefully four of, of those, but definitely three uh, uh, today. And we're going to be starting with uh, uh, Joseph Edelheit, who is a uh, joint major in, in history and, uh, and English. All of the people who are presenting today also presented uh, last week at the uh, NCUR conference, the National Council for Undergraduate Research. And so the, the uh, you know, and, and, they, and they were well received. So it's been, it's been a very good group to work with. And, and for me, it's fun to have humanities people in the, in the thesis class. So I will turn it over to Joseph. Um, hello, I am Joseph Adelheit, and this is my project, uh, The Astronaut, the Man of Today's Tomorrow. Uh, my thesis advisor is Professor Rawson, with also help from Professor Johnson. Um, okay. So this is my thesis question. Uh, my project utilizes and argues that fictional sources are a vital part of the historical record and can be used as studies to understand these same histories. In terms of fictional sources, I focus on film, television, and other visual media. In addition to contemporary understandings of these media examples, focusing on the astronaut throughout American culture. Um, given that it's a historical analysis, it's not just a close reading of individual sources. They need to be put into their historical contexts, both of global significance like the Cold War, but also more directly related to the space program like NASA policy and other the, what the Soviet Union is doing at the same time. Um, as such, this is a broad analysis of a somewhat of a perhaps diverse set of sources, um, which is beyond the current scope of the time constraints that I thought we had. But um, so instead of dealing with everything, I wanted for this talk to focus on one particular theme that runs throughout astronaut media, um, specifically focusing on this image, which is, I don't know if I can take this mic with me. Um, I, I can, OK. Um, the, the, so this is from the film Rocketship XM. It is the first supposedly scientific um, astronaut film. It was made in 18 days. It's not particularly good because it was made in 18 days. Um, but th there's a lot of things that don't particularly look like how we would imagine the astronaut. Um, these people are on Mars for context and they have no environmental protection. All their faces are uncovered. You can see their hands. They, they probably would just die from what our understanding. Um, another interesting thing is um, her. Uh, women astronauts were a legal impossibility until 1978, but in 1950, they seemed to think that that was a certain, certainly a thing that could have happened uh, in the more recent than, than 28 years later. Um, but what I do want to focus for this talk is that's a knife and that's a gun and you cannot see it, but this man also has a pistol and why? Um, so... Early sources, early sources uh, which come right out of World War II, retain a deep fear that there is going to be an immediate, if not right, right after World War II, then certainly in the very recent future, uh, a coming global conflict between the free world and communism. Um, space is the new front of this war. Um, it is the, the newest thing, and we need to be ready because we need to defend uh, ourselves against Soviet aggression in this new space. Well, because it is space, but yeah. Um, astronauts themselves are not only defenders, they're also conquerors. Uh, they go out into space to gain scientific knowledge for the free world, but not only scientific knowledge, also material resources. Uh, this is from a film from, this is the Angry Red Planet from 1959. Uh, that man, I should be pointing, but one second. Uh, that man has a very long gun, and that's also a pistol, and their stated objective in the film is to conquer Mars, to gain material resources for America. Um, Um, as, as time goes on, we, we learn about space because we actually start going into space because those sources were before the actual space program even happened. Uh, and we figure out that space is actually really scary. Uh, you can just die if you don't have oxygen and radiation will just also kill you and lots of other things you can't easily shoot at and solve. Um, so this raises a problem of like, oh no, all our weapons, they're not going to work. What do we do? Well, we don't abandon our weapons. Our astronauts are still fighters. They're just tragic heroes who are still going to militarily enter space. 
They're just also going to die a lot. Uh, but they're heroes for trying, um, but they're not going to succeed. Um, what, what begins to happen is we begin to have this failure narrative um, because space is so powerful and so vast and we are so insignificant. Um, but we try anyway, and that's what makes us heroes. Uh, this is from an episode of The Twilight Zone. Uh, what happens here is that three American astronauts go into space and crash land back down, and then over the course of the episode, all three of them are wiped from existence without any record and without anyone ever remembering them existing. Uh, and it just ends with, yeah, that's just what happens. Whoops. Um, and it's just a cosmic error beyond human understanding that we can never possibly solve. Um, if, if we can't, if we can't conquer space, and we can't really solve any of those problems, uh, maybe, maybe there, the, at later sources begin to argue that there maybe is something we, we can solve as astronauts, and maybe that's the Cold War. Because um, if we humans are so tiny and insignificant in the vast face of space in its totality, uh, our conflicts and animosities, not just as astronauts, but just in general, are really stupid and insignificant. And perhaps uh, someone who has to see how tiny humanity actually is and uninfluenced by the material conditions that cause many of our conflicts will become not a vanguard of the free world to, to conquer and fight, but maybe for peace and cooperation. Um, these, this is the first actual, this is not a fictional, fictional source. This is the actual Apollo Soyuz test from 1975. Uh, these three men are American astronauts. These two are Soviet cosmonauts. They fly in this, but it's not to scale. Um, and it's the first manned international space flight, and it works, and nobody tries to kill each other or anything. Um, so what begins to happen around this time is we have the, the rescue narrative where um, either American astronauts or Soviet cosmonauts begin to rescue the other group from the variety of dangers in space. It's generally Americans rescuing Soviet cosmonauts because we kind of can't give up that idea that we're, we're still the primary space doers but sometimes it's the opposite. Um, and in general, it's the idea that, well, we're all humans and we should all be working together. And the idea that, well, maybe we can, uh, maybe space is a place of international cooperation and not war. Um, what is particularly interesting about, about the Apollo-Soyuz test um, and fictional sources is this film. Uh, this film is Marooned from 1969. Uh, this man is an American astronaut. Uh, the plot of the film is that he and his two other astronaut friends get stuck in space and cannot return to the space station that they came from and also cannot safely land. And they are quickly running out of oxygen. And while the United States sends a rescue mission to try and save them, it's actually the Soviet Union. You can't really see him, but this guy is a cosmonaut um, who, before the United States can even possibly rescue their own astronauts, send one of their own people who was supposed to be on a completely unrelated mission, not really caring about the Americans, to save them. And, it doesn't really, this was the best shot I could get to show it, but it doesn't really, whatever. Um, but what's particularly interesting is that in the Apollo-Soyuz project, in preliminary talks for that, um, the United States government decided, how are we going to convince the Soviet Union that we're actually not going to try and kill them? Well, what if we just show them this movie, this nonsense fiction movie that has never existed, that will surely convince them. And that seemingly happened, and somehow... The, the project did happen, so I guess our, our fiction does good things. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, this is just the taste, taste of the possibility of fiction. Um, it doesn't only apply to the astronaut. These are also not the only things that apply to astronauts. Um, it can apply to any media and any of the features we find in them. Um, so when we go and see fictional media, uh, maybe we can think about how they've been formed by our histories, how our current events will inform future fiction, and also maybe sometimes how our fiction informs our futures. And that is my project. Sure. Tell me about your favorite source. Oh, um, well, there's a lot of sources. I like, um, there's a, a single season show from 1959 to 1960 called Men Into Space, and it is very odd because generally we think of history as a continuity and a specific, no, maybe a, a line, and this kind of proves that it's not because that's not actually how history works, and it's generally an extremely progressive source for its time. Um, it argues that 
much earlier than anyone else, it argues that maybe we shouldn't be fighting in space, and maybe the Cold War is really stupid, and maybe the Soviet Union are actually humans. And also, maybe, maybe the astronaut is a genderless concept, and actually female astronauts are a thing that can happen. And that is weird because it exists decades before anyone else was trying, but it also got canceled after one season, so whoops. Okay, so technically it wasn't a source. It was John Glenn, because John Glenn runs for Senate on the back of essentially being an astronaut. And not that that is a bad thing, but my question was just trying to explore how American culture understands the astronaut in contrast to the engineers or mathematicians or anyone else also involved in the same stuff. Like, why is it going into, why is the going into space part inherently the most impo important thing? And then accidentally sort of fell into all of this. So wait, for your definition of astronaut, where, where, does, where does Star Trek fit in to that? Oh, okay. Um, well, hmm, you see, we, we, we practiced this question. <laughs> this is cheating. Um, okay, no, so the astronaut, I mean, I gave, uh, it's hard to define exactly what the astronaut is. Um, I want to say that they have to wear spacesuits, but we just saw in the other source that they, they don't sometimes. Um, but um, the way that I, my project argues it is essentially that if space is the final frontier, then the astronaut is sort of the cowboy, maybe with less indigenous genocide, depending. Um, but uh, so that just in the way that American culture understands the train is the thing that closed the West and killed the cowboy, that Star Trek might be the space train that kills the space cowboy, which is the astronaut, uh, possibly. everyone. My name is Josh Narisma. Um, my advisor was Professor Richards and my instructor was Professor Johnson. And this is the title of my presentation, Feminizing History's Depictions of the Black Female Form in West African Art. Um, and my research question was really, how has the rise of contemporary African women artists impacted gender complementarity and depictions of the black female form in West African art? And by adopting a chronological approach employing um, art-based and historiogra historiographical research, I was really aiming to illuminate representations of the black female form within the West African art canon, which remain largely misunderstood by a lot of audiences outside of West Africa, and also to challenge mainstream Euro-American notions of black womanhood. The first big portion of my project was colonial depictions of African women, and this quote by Homie Baba encapsulates a lot about what I was trying to tackle with this um, part, portion of my project. And he says the epithets racial or sexual contribution as a mode of differentiation that's informed the discursive and political practices of racial and cultural hierarchization. And although he doesn't say it, he's essentially echoing what Kimberly Crenshaw said in 1989, which is when she coined the term intersectional feminism. And that's sort of the framework that I adopted within this paper. I wanted to see what are the connecting threads between misogyny and racism and how does that inform depictions of African women in comparison to their male counterparts. So this is the first example we're looking at. This is A Man and Woman at the Cape of Good Hope from 1626. Um, and although this doesn't, this depicts, uh, this is the Cape of Good Hope for South Africa, so it doesn't necessarily depict West Africans, but I do think it shows a lot of the broader attitudes that we see in a lot of general depictions of African people in general. And I really wanted to um, call the differences between how the man and the woman are represented. So the man, as you can see here, looks um, very contemplative. He's standing in this upright position and he really fulfills what, we come, what has come to be known as the noble savage stereotype. And the noble savage sounds like a positive connotation, but it does um, also point out the things of naivety and also disregards any pre-colonial indigenous achievements. Um, in comparison, the woman is the opposite in the brutal savage. and this is depicted in several ways. So she's standing in this very animalistic position. She has a grotesque expression. 
Um, she has what we call simian features, so like ape-like features. She has very long, extended arms. Um, her leg is raised in this awkward way. You also see the baby on her back, and that became um, a stereotypical image um, in a lot of representations of African mothers with their babies because it was seen as an exotic image. You also see the baby suckling from her breast, just wrapping and possibly around her shoulder. And this is um, one example of the perceived promiscuity of African women and how they were monstrously sexual um, in comparison to their male counterparts. And then lastly, in her left hand, you see human entrails, and that represents the um, Western misconception that cannibalism was a common practice among African cultures. Um, the anthropologist William Ahrens contends that anthropophagic myths in particular were used to defend um, colonization of the continent. And we see a lot of anthropophagic myths um, in West Africa, especially. He refutes the claims of cannibalism among the Sierra, um, among the Mende people in Sierra Leone, especially. I got you, yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Um, I wanted to talk about as well um, postcards, um, and this portion of my project is about um, mass media and colonial expositions. Um, this is a postcard called June Field Type Lebu, which means French West Africa, Senegal. And my main argument um, with regards to postcards is that um, they became a substitute for owning the African body, especially the African female body, during an era where um, slavery was becoming increasingly outlawed. And what we see is that many depictions of African women were bordering on the erotic, even pornographic. Um, in my paper, I include the unblurred version of this image, but for the purposes of this presentation, not to re-exploit the woman in the photo, I've chosen to blur it. Um, and there are many other examples of this. Postcards can be broadly split into um, anthropometric postcards, which are when you use physical um, characteristics to classify a person based on their intelligence or evolutionary inferiority. And that was one way to show um, the differences in the perceived um, uncivilizedness of African people in comparison to their civilized Western counterparts. And there were also ethnographic postcards, which depicted African people in supposedly um, daily cultural rituals. But a lot of the times, these photographs were actually staged, and they depicted stereotypical tribalistic activities that were not even true to what the Africans themselves were doing. Um, and I talk about how um, postcards um, became a subject for, um, they became a medium to own the African woman in particular, and I show that how um, she became, I guess, an object of fantasy to a lot of Westerners, and um, the way she was perceived was very different in comparison to her male counterparts. Um, the next major portion of my picture is gender com complementarity in West African art, and gender complementarity broadly refers to the belief that men and women occupy divergent spaces in uh, society that impacts, it, that impacts everything from economy to politics and to art. And in, in the context of my paper, I talk about how there are masculine art forms, such as figurative sculpture, um, wood, and metal, um, especially in West Africa. And there are also feminine art forms, such as pottery, ceramics, um, basket weaving, textiles, stuff like that. And I, for the purposes of the presentation, I really want to talk about examples of um, West African female art um, in history. Um, so this is a ceremonial lidded vessel with female devotee, the river god Ayinle by Abatan. Um, this came from a source which is really interesting because the source talks about all these different types of figurative ceramics in West African art, which I thought was really cool because for a long time, um, West African female figurative ceramicists were largely ignored and a lot of their works were either ascribed to men or they're just not documented in history a lot. So I'm really glad I came across the source um, um, to talk about their works. Um, this is also another example of women's led art in West Africa. This is the Mende Sowa masquerade in Sierra Leone. Um, masquerading is popular across West and Central Africa in general, but what's unique about this is that even though the costumes are crafted by men, like all masquerades in Africa are, this is the only documented instance of um, females performing the masquerading instance in Africa, so it's really interesting. Um, the Mende Sowa masquerade is also led by the secret society the secret female-only society known as the Sandi Society. And the members of the Sandi Society, once they reach initiation, which is part of what this um, masquerade is for, hold a lot of um, influence over the community, whether it be with art, um, politics, family, stuff like that. And then the last major portion of my project is contemporary African woman artists. And for the context of my project, I define contemporary African woman artists as being from the 1970s onwards. And the reason for that is, um,
And the reason for that is um, one of the sources I um, looked at talked about how um, contemporary African women artists grew in numbers after achieving economic independence in the 1970s to 1980s. And what was interesting about this is that um, that source I looked at talked about how African feminist movements, which is kind of hard to define because the word feminism is largely a Western construct, and those Western constructs tend to ignore the black female experience. Um, the African feminist movement largely arose independently from the first and second wave feminist movements occurring in the West around the same time. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, for this, I'm going to be looking at uh, Sakari Douglas Camp. Um, and what's interesting about her is that um, she's Nigerian, and her work um, does figurative sculpture using steel. That's her favorite method. Um, that's her favorite medium. And as I mentioned earlier, not only is figurative figurative sculpture uh, typically a masculine field, but so is metalwork. And so this shows that contemporary African woman artists um, really disrupted gender complementarity in the region. Um, this work by her is a Lali Aru. This one is a Logban Limbo. And this one specifically looks at um, a crisis in the 90s when the Shell Company was um, exploiting the oil area, um, the oil fields in Nigeria and pumping a bunch of barrels from there. Um, and the, milit the military government of Nigeria um, executed the Ogoni Nine, which were people who pr protested the um, oil drilling in the region. So she wanted to show that through this. Um, and this is just one of many examples of women artists using their work to consider pressing cultural issues. Um, and also, for example, these two look at the Kalabari masquerading practices, so their work looks at um, cultural practices and also depictions of women, as you can see in the back here, um, and also the masquerader, who's a male but depicting a woman. Um, so ultimately, I just want to say that contemporary African women's art is contextualized by historical examples of African female self-representation. It disrupts gender complementarity and the distinction between high versus low art, and is that their reclamation of the black female form. And that's all. Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering, is, is, uh, is it the scene, I mean, I guess it depends on what lens you're looking at. Yeah. Is you know, this, this artist as an example mm -hmm. working in what would be typically you know, masculine yeah. work? Is, is that providing a sense of legitimization to her work? Because that is, you know, it's, it's coming across as not just, you know, can be work of women, but yeah. it's, you know, about the things or textiles. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in my thesis, I talk about um, both of those things. Like, I think one of the sources I said that it was considered um, abhorrent for her to work in fields. Like, um, her her culture wouldn't have seen it as a good thing for her to be using this medium. Um, but I, I do think what you're saying is also true that it does provide some sort of legitimization of the art form. So I think there's an element of both to that. Um, I think. What also makes her work so-called abhorrent is because she discusses gender, well, the illusion of gender. So in this one specifically, um, this is a Kalabari masquerading. And the, as I said, the performer would have been male, but and he's depicting a female goddess, but he's lifted up by the people here. So his genitalia would have been exposed, and that disrupts the illusion of gender. And so, like, I don't know, her work is controversial in many ways for reasons like that, beyond just the fact that she's using metal. So um, I don't know, I hope that answers your question. There's a bit of both to it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so prior to asking my advisor to advise for me for this project, I took three classes with him, um, including um, like African African women's art history, like an art history class. I'm Professor Richards, I love him. Um, and so he really sparked that interest for me. He's done field work in Ghana as well with like women's fashion. Um, so he really sparked that interest in me. I also grew up like in a female dominated household. So I've really been interested in like telling the stories of women. Um, and yeah, and I also fully recognize that I'm neither African nor a woman. So like, this is not me like speaking on behalf of people. I actually, I really made an effort in this project to cite sources by um, scholars within West Africa, especially gender scholars. So that was something I really emphasized and I really wanted to um, approach it with care. So yeah, thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite part of the group? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the contemporary African woman section was probably really fun for me because a lot of it was um, 
honestly like my interpretation. I mean, like I did find like other sources as well, but like I had a lot of space there for my own creative thinking and like talking with my advisor about that. Um, especially since they are more contemporary, there's not a lot of documented works for some of the artists I looked at. So I don't know, it was really cool to look at artists that um, I guess aren't as well known um, outside of West Africa. So I really enjoyed doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know especially for when I was looking at gender complementarity, you know, I was looking at historical instances of both um, art, of art created by both African men and African women. And what I saw is that a lot of it was plundered, especially the, the best example is the Benin Exposition in which a lot of um, art was taken from the Benin city and like destroyed or taken back to Europe. Um, and the art that remained was largely um, ascribed to be created by men. So like there was like definitely a lack in research there. I was very fortunate to find some sources like by um, an art historian named um, uh, Mary Burns and she looked at, she really did a lot of field work as well going to Africa and look and I guess like rewriting that narrative and looking at a bunch of historical examples of this specifically figurative ceramics made by women. Um, but yeah, I know it's very, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. I think for future research, um, people should look at um, more of that historical approach to art um, and seeing if we can like maybe rediscover that. So I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. No. Oh, I lied, it's on. The screen? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay, so it's going to be really hard to follow up those two amazing presentations, but, <laughs> um, but my name is Gravinda Liu, and I will be presenting my thesis on the paradox of tragic art. Um, so there are many examples of works of art that depict tragedy and suffering. Here we have the painting of Inconsolable Grief by Russian painter Ivan Kromsky, um, who made this piece after the death of his two sons and depicted his wife as the main subject. The piece displays a restraint of emotion where his wife is not visibly crying. I wish I could point to her eyes, but it's a little tall. But, um, but you can see that her eyes are swollen and red from endless tears beforehand. It's a depiction of silent exhaustion and grief. The lack of movement and the lack of extreme displays of emotion within the piece might be the reason as to why are so many are so moved by the painting and why it's all the more tragic. The piece remains a story of inconsolable grief, one that is often silent and continues to endure in solitude in spite of all the movement within the world. Here we have the 3rd of May 1808 by Francisco Goya and it illustrates the tragic massacre of Spanish freedom fighters by the French. The brutal slaughter of innocent lives forced Goya to reconcile with the horrors of war. For our main protagonist, who is here dressed in white, death tragically awaits as we see the men who have already fell to this fate by his feet. We also see the men that tower behind him in fear and cover their eyes to hopelessly avoid death. So here's a less obvious depiction of tragedy. At first glance, this painting is seemingly free from all sadness as we see a joyous depiction of a woman swinging on a swing in front of what is presumed to be her lover. Um, the painting is lit with these very beautiful bright colors and the subjects seem free and happy. But, but if we look closely in the back corner and I'll kind of move over here to show, um, we can see the same man actually who's in the front of the painting all the way in the back of the painting, and he actually seems to be trying to rein in the girl on the swing back towards him. So here we're able to see a depiction of a man trying to rein in the ropes of time. So through these three pieces, we can see that tragedy comes in all form, and even the most joyous of paintings can have a layer of sadness within them. 
Um, so what do we mean by tragic art? Um, it involves narratives that grapple with the question of morality and the meaning of life. Um, and this art form serves as a mirror for audiences. It allows viewers to confront very raw emotions, such as sadness and grief that define our shared existence. However, we often run from these very big emotions in real life, feelings like solitude, loneliness, the grief, are emotions that I wouldn't expect everybody wants to feel on a day-to-day -day basis, and we would actually want the exact opposite of this. Um, so this brings us to the paradox behind tragic art. If we often seek to limit the pain within real life situations, why do we seek out such experiences when viewing tragic art, and why do we enjoy it? So one of the more popular theories and one is one that this thesis is largely based on um, is the distancing embracing model from Menninghouse and his colleagues in 2017. So Menninghouse argues that tragic art often involves the complex interplay between both negative and positive emotions, which can be seen both in the display of art and within the viewer themselves. Um, we have the distancing factor, which distances ourselves from the piece as we view it for what it is an art piece. Um, so this allows us to acutely acknowledge the negative emotions we feel, leading us to ultimately embrace it. Um, so tragic art is often not comprised of just sad things. It often has positive emotional antidotes, such as nostalgia weave throughout, and it eventually leads to this positive payout of, a joint, of enjoyment. Um, overall, the emotional variation of tragic art can be seen as a source of enjoyment itself. You're taken through this very intense but rewarding emotional experience. So this leads us into the three main research questions that my thesis is trying to answer. Um, first is how do freely chosen painful life experiences affect our willingness to view tragic art? Um, the second is how does viewing tragic art affect our viewing experience? So for example, are we more moved than usual? Do we experience both po positive and negative emotional affect? Um, and lastly, can viewing tragic art change our attitudes about groups that are suffering? So for our study, we had a total of 150 participants, 75 were women and 75 were men. Um, they all identified as politically conservative and a majority identified as racially white. The mean age was 45.8 years and majority pursued a degree past their high school diploma. Participants ended up viewing a total of five minutes worth of tragic art through a multimedia installation and were asked a series of questions assessing their emotional affect and feelings of being moved slash meaningfulness. Um, we also had an immigration attitude skill that measured participants' attitudes towards undocumented refugees. Um, this was adapted from the study conducted in 2022 by Zeng and Winner. Um, there were a total of eight statements. Four were empathetic towards the plight of refugees and four were unsympathetic. So an, uh, an example of an unsympathetic statement would be undocumented refugees are often criminals. Um, then the participants had a seven point scale uh, to rate the statements off of from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Participants completed the scale at the beginning of the study and then after watching the tragic art videos. So to answer our first research question, participants rated their chosen painful life experiences more positively than their non-chosen painful life experiences. 59.3% um, of the participants preferred viewing a joy sculpture. So I took this out based off of time's sake, but I'll go into it now. Um, the participants had a choice of three videos that they could have watched. Um, the first choice was a joyous sculpture and multimedia installation. The second was kind of a neutral one. And then th the third was the tragic art videos. Um, this was also a layer of deception just because all 150 participants did end up watching the tragic art videos, but they were still asked to pick um, and then they were asked to explain why they chose the video that they chose. So in this case, only 16% only were actually willing to view the tragic art sculptures on refugees. Um, and then also the affect ratings on their painful life experiences did not predict the willingness to view the tragic art. So to answer our second research question, um, meaningful ratings were positively correlated with moved ratings, and also both negative and positive affect ratings predicted the feeling of being moved and the feeling of meaningfulness within participants. So there is definitely a correlation, but since we did a linear regression, we cannot say one causes the other. Um, so future research should look into the correlation between the two. To answer our third question, um, IAS scores significantly increased following the view of, tragic, of the tragic art video, indicating more empathetic views towards undocumented refugees. This is an extremely interesting finding. Um, a compilation of videos that only lasted about five minutes was able to change the acute opinions of a conservative sample on a group that is undocumented and also refugees. 
And then um, participants also completed a VIAC questionnaire from Specker et al., which was a study conducted in 2018 that kind of just assessed their engagement and interest within the, within the arts. And we were able to find that both of those were positively correlated. And also engagement and interest in the arts were able to predict a change in attitudes within the, uh, towards refugees. So this is also an extremely um, interesting and like kind of me and my advisor were like, oh, this is an, a very, we didn't expect this finding because it raises the question of whether those who are already engaged in, and interested in the arts find themselves to be more open-minded when it comes to the arts. So are they more open to changing their opinions after viewing arts? Um, we don't know, but it opens the door for future research. So our findings were able to highlight that tragic art not only has the ability to initiate feelings of being moved and of meaningfulness, but it also has the ability to change attitudes significantly, albeit acutely. So with, it, with this finding, art can be used as a vessel to promote empathy within society, especially to combat a recent crisis in the collapse, collapse of compassion, uh, where individuals are reluctant to help or be compassionate towards a group that is suffering. These findings also lead us into the discussion of whether more interest and engagement in the arts leads individuals to be more pro-social. Um, so our findings are in agreement with other studies such as Arola in 2016 and Coy in 2019 that um, say yes to this question. Our findings are overall in agreement with the distancing embracing model of Menninghaus as well. Um, so we were able to find that tragic art leads to not only an emotionally rich experience with the payout um, of feeling moved and finding meaning within the art as well. So there were limitations in this study. Um, a major one that was that it was conducted online. So videos were shown virtually and the participants could not enter an art gallery and see the intri intricacies within, hello, okay, <laughs> intricacies of the sculptures themselves. Um, they were also limited to what the video showed um, and the time limit of the video. Also, this study only assessed acute attitude change, one that was immediately um, followed watching the tragic art videos. So it raises the question, will these attitude changes hold up in a week, a month, in a year? So to reiterate, art is a valuable resource to society. It has the power to change opinions, albeit through a very short video, um, and it has the ability to drive our society to becoming more empathetic. These findings overall open the door for future research. A longitudinal version of the study should be conducted where participants are exposed to multiple pieces of art and researchers should assess opinion changes and if they remain changed for a long duration of time. Future studies should explore the impact of different mediums of art on participants. So do participants feel of this variety of emotion with literature or movies? Um, are they more impactful than visual arts? And also a study assessing gender and its influence on art and empathy, empathy should also be conducted. So these are my acknowledgements. Um, my advisor on this thesis was Jen Drake and this thesis could not at all have been done without her. She provided so much support, research, resources and guidance um, and I love our weekly meetings that we have. And then of course my thesis professor, Professor Johnson. Um, uh, thank you for just provi providing so many ideas to help fuel this thesis and yeah, here are my references. Thank you. Does anybody have questions? <laughs> Yeah, so my advisor actually conducted a part one of this study where the sample was um, politically democratic. Um, that was like through prolific. She didn't actually want a fully uh, homogeneous sample of Democrats, but that's how it ended up. So in this part of the study, we actually wanted to see whether tragic art has the ability to change um, within the population that politically conservative research has been shown that they're more in, unsympathetic initially to the plight of refugees and also immigrants. Um, so we wanted to see like, can a five minute video also change the opinions of this sample? Um, and yeah, we were expecting that racially it would be homogenous towards racially identifying as um, white or biracial with white as um, being white passing. Um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting to find that through prolific that we were able to kind of make our sample into politically conservative, yeah. Yes. This is more of a interpretive question for you. You did mention that this is more of a group, so you're not sure if it'll kind of change mm -hmm. in the future, but I'm wondering, like, you do have this paradox of tragic art, so I'm wondering if you think that in order to sustain it, like, it needs to keep reaching these types 
that yeah. Big? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I definitely think they will have to continuously see at least media representation of refugees who are going through um, difficult times to get green cards or at least just enter the country itself. Um, I had a question at NCURD that was really great. It was, um, how do you kind of combat the bias if you're going to continuously show this population um, refugees and sculptures of refugees? Um, I think our society is very geared towards written articles rather than seeing the plight of minorities through videos or just hearing their voices through interviews, which I think is a lot more powerful and impactful than just reading or seeing their their lives represented as a number, which I think we're seeing with a lot of refugees and just immigrants coming in. Um, so I think to combat the bias in terms of kind of showing them continuously, we have to, I think, implement a lot more visual art within our sphere. We have to show these sculptures, um, push artists up that are in exhibitions like the Met, the MoMA, you know, the Guggenheim, have these sculptures present where people can really take in the fear and the isolation that goes into I mean, migrating to a whole different country. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answered your question. I kind of went on tangent, but. <laughs> yes. I was just wondering, I mean, just to pick up on that, I'm just wondering if, if future research, I mean, I don't think you would have probably seen this, but future research might suggest, you know, looking at, is it, a, is it are you able to use tragic art in an abstract or not mm -hmm. like, a, like a direct, you know, testing whether or not they have more empathy towards immigrants or, or refugees, um, but their experience hasn't been images or, or art related specifically to that, but an abstract something else that's tragic in its own way that mm -hmm. may be related, you know, a similar um, you know, historical mm -hmm. thing that happened, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, you know, like, yeah. you know, forced immigration of other people in 1820 mm -hmm. um, and versus, you know, the experience of, of contemporary people. Yeah. 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 No, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I think from my experience when I was le reading, at least through education, um, the plight of refugees throughout history, I think is documented a lot with just numbers, you're not really seeing their individual stories presented unless you're reading like narrative tales or you're seeing their abstract art themselves. Um, so I think we kind of have to balance between showing the numbers, but also showing individual plights themselves. I think it, it holds a lot more emotional weight when you can easily connect with a person who is living life just as you are, instead of just seeing, you know, the number 100,000 people migrated to the Americas. like. Conceptually, it's too broad to understand how many people are actually migrating and seeking refuge. Um, so I think our, I think um, at least in terms of abstract art, um, there's great artists who use abstract art as a vessel to show their inner um, emotions towards fighting refugees, uh, the refugee plight. Um, I think really showcasing that in media through education as well. Um, I think that would really help with more empathetic views and just being more well-rounded on their flight because I think a lot of us are in the privileged um, position that we don't have to face those because we live in America and especially New York. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered your question as well. <laughs> yes. Could, could, could you generalize about your study, or perhaps, perhaps not, but are there ways in which this study speaks to the importance of, of art mm -hmm. quite apart from the issue yeah, for sure. Um, I think we're seeing a shift away from art in our education. Unfortunately, we're getting a lot of defunding in our arts. Um, personally, for me, art art was like a major part of growing up. I was heavily invested in like music, literature, film, um, and I think it just helped me have more of a well-rounded view of society. And the fact that we're able to see that a five-minute video is able to acutely change opinions of a demographic that is probably initially very unsympathetic towards undocumented refugees. I mean, that just goes to show like art has the ability to change opinions and we should be harnessing that resource a lot more in our education, in our society. Um, and the collapse of compassion is actually 
I read it while I was uh, conducting this research, and it, it showed that populations of people who are in a priv privileged uh, position are able to um, empathize with one person, but as soon as that problem is generalized to a huge group, immediately that empathy just falls apart. You're not um, donating monetarily, you're not trying to help them, um, these groups. So it's, it's kind of scary that we're heading in that direction, and I think art can be used as a resource to help combat that, so yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So our, our, our fourth person appears not, not to have made it today. So, so for the thesis class, it's just three that are, that are presenting. Uh, you can see Joseph, Gervin, and Josh, uh, along with Mustafa, was, was the fourth. And he was going to be talking about um, uh, uh, Monk, uh, Fitzgerald, and, and music of the Harlem Renaissance, um, as well as other uh, senior uh, thesis uh, students. Chloe, um, at the uh, Senior Thesis uh, Showcase, which is May the 6th and May the, uh, the 9th. Thank you. <laughs>